Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sent this man or his parents that were born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And I must work the works of him who sent me while it's still day. For the night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Father, we thank you for what you did through Jesus. Lord, it's an honor. It's a privilege to be able to worship you. Lord, we were born blind. We were born in sin. Lord, in us dwells no good thing but you love us and you want to touch us and you want to heal us. And so now, Lord, we just simply ask that you would speak to us. Move in our midst. Draw us in, draw us close. Lord, help us to find a wonderful olive tree in the cool of the day. Lord, help us to sit down at your feet. Cast aside the cares of the world. Let you care for us tonight pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Can I share a bit with you tonight? A little from my heart. It's a familiar passage. And Jesus is going to go on and he's going to speak yet another I am statement to the disciples and to those who are listening. But if you remember the story that we just started in John chapter 9, we're going to go to John 10 here in a moment. But in John chapter 9, picking up in verse 18, after Jesus has healed this man who was born blind, you see, the world is always looking for reasons why things are the way they are. And notice that Jesus didn't answer with a why, but with a what for. He said, that God may work in this man's life. Didn't give him the reason. He spoke what he was doing. I want you to see how the Pharisees responded. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received his sight until they called him who had received his sight and they asked him saying, is this your son? You see the parents come on the scene, yep, that's my boy. We know this is our son and he was born blind. You see the skepticism? You, you, you see the inability of the world to recognize exactly what Jesus was doing. You see, the world was looking for some kind of formula, something that they could then follow, maybe do. Perhaps the Pharisees themselves were thinking, you know, if we could just figure out how to heal people, you know, maybe we could increase our giving in the temple or something. But Jesus didn't respond. They go on and they keep talking amongst, amongst themselves. Finally, the man answered and said to them, in verse 30, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he's opened my eyes. You see, the blind man knew. When we come to Jesus, a lot of times we can't actually give an explanation, can we? All of a sudden, we just know the truth when we see it. We know the door when it's presented. 
If this man, it says in verse 33, were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins, and you're teaching us. Notice the response of the Pharisees. They cast him out. The world is still casting out the truth of who Jesus is. The world is still trying to make it into religion. And what Jesus really wanted was a relationship. The world is still trying to figure out some kind of program when all Jesus wants is for that power of prayer to reach into our hearts so that he can work in us by faith. For as the author of Hebrews writes to us, for without faith it is impossible to please God. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? What a difference faith makes, amen? What a difference faith makes. You see the Pharisees who bragged about how well they knew the Old Testament. Jesus had already reminded them. He said, you search the scripture for you think in these you have life. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And he answered in verse 36 of John 9, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who's talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And notice the response. He worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world. It's not something we like to hear out of the lips of Jesus, is it? For judgment I have come into the world. That those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. You see, the world's still looking for programs. The world's still looking for religion. The world's still looking for some kind of thing that they can do. And then some of the Pharisees in verse 40, who were with him, heard these things and said to him, are we blind also? The answer was yes. And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, and therefore your sin remains. It is so important for us to remember that when we read the Bible, the chapter and verse designations that we have in our English Bibles were not there in the original context. It is in that context that we come to John 10. The context of a man born blind, a man that was healed, a man that had been excommunicated by the Pharisees, a, a man that when you would have looked at his life, you would have said, man, this guy's going nowhere. He was not on the fast track to wonderful things. It is there in verse 10 that Jesus speaks this next statement where he declares who he is. For most assuredly, verse one of John 10 says, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. There is no other way. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes in before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. 
And yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of the strangers. And verse 6 of John 10 goes on to say, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. You see, he had been speaking to them in a way that they should have fully understood, and yet they didn't. And so Jesus, using this man born blind as the chief example, speaks to them again and says, for most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. Why didn't the sheep hear them? Because Jesus had already told them the sheep know the master's voice. And the master had not yet spoken. Religion had spoken. The law had spoken. But the master had not spoken. The shepherd had not spoken. I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And will go in and he will find pasture. For the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. And I have come that you might have life, that they may have it more abundantly, for I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Do you believe the message of the gospel? Do you believe the message of the gospel? Because the message of the gospel is the most exclusive message ever taught. It's not inclusive in the sense that the world thinks of inclusivity. Jesus is basically saying that there's exactly one door. There's not multiple doors. The world puts this feel-good message out there that all roads lead to heaven. When in fact in Matthew chapter 7 as Jesus is preaching this Sermon on the Mount, you travel with us to Israel, we'll actually go to this mount where Jesus preached this sermon above the Sea of Galilee as you look down towards the cove of the sower. You can imagine the disciples gathered and the crowd gathered out in this gigantic field before the lake just speaking. You see, Jesus didn't preach that message that all roads lead to heaven. He said, in fact, narrow is the way and few there are who find it. And so in this next I am statement, the real gospel excludes all other roads. The real gospel provides exactly one door through which we must pass. Isn't it crazy when you get asked, you know, oh, you, you've got, maybe you've got a Bible on the front seat of your vehicle and you give somebody a ride from work and there it is and they ask you, do you read that? And we'll usually say something like, well, it's my wife's. <laughs> now, I know you would never do that, but people get very specific. Well, what must I do to be saved? Well, you know, you, you kind of sort of need to go to church. It'd be a good thing if you, you know, maybe you prayed with somebody. Tell me, God, we have the responsibility to take the good news of the gospel into the world. And the gospel is a very specific message that Jesus is the door. And there isn't another door. There's not another way into the kingdom in that sense. You see, religion had been preached to this man who was born blind. And it didn't save him. But the message of the gospel, that message he responded to as soon as he heard the voice of the shepherd. Look what he did. I believe. We need to keep the main thing the main thing, folks, because your family is depending on it. Your coworkers are 
their eternal destiny lies in the hands of that message. Jesus said, I am the door. There isn't a universal salvation. You see, the world's been trying to extinguish the light and take away the bread and close the door since day one. You see how these things all tie together? Jesus said very exclusively, I am the light of the world. Very exclusively, I am the bread of life. Very exclusively, I am the door. And as he said those things, he was saying, I and I alone am these things. No one else is these things. There is no other way. And as he says, for judgment I've come into the world in chapter 9. You see, the self-righteous Pharisees had rejected the light of the world. They didn't want that light. They didn't want the message that Jesus was preaching. Can I tell you that your family may reject that message as well? Your friends may reject that message. Your co-workers may reject that message. The world is certainly rejecting that exact message. You talk to them about God, they'll talk about God all day long. They'll even talk about godly things, righteousness in a, in a sense, all day long. But the moment you say, did you know that Jesus declared himself to be the door? And any other way is of thieves and robbers. Wow, well, that's a little bit too narrow. I mean, come on, Jeff. You mean my Buddhist friends? Don't have the real Jesus? Yep, that's correct. You mean my animist friends who believe that there are spirits in every tree? That literally Jesus might be related to a beaver? They don't have the same Jesus? That's correct. You mean that Krishna and Vishnu are not the same as Yahweh? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because that's what Jesus said. The sheepfold at that time, it's important that you understand what Jesus was saying. The sheepfold at the time this message was preached was basically a square enclosure. It was normally made out of rocks, and it was usually allowed purposefully to be overgrown with thorns and vines. They would actually go out and find the gnarliest vine they could find. Sometimes you've all heard of the Rose of Sharon. That's actually a, a strain of roses that grows rather prolifically throughout all of, the, all of Israel. In the Jordan River Valley, it's virtually everywhere. But it's pretty thorny. And they would take and plant those in the tops of the walls. And the hope was that those walls would become very overgrown and eventually get so gnarly that nobody would want to climb over them. And so what the sheepfold was, was an enclosure. There was not a door as we know it. There wasn't a gate as we know it. There was a hole into the sheepfold. And the shepherd would lay in the hole. He became literally the door himself through which the sheep went out and the sheep came in. And if you did not go through the shepherd, you did neither of those two things. Because the walls were tall and they were covered with all manner of things that you would never want to put yourself through to get into the sheepfold. And so as Jesus uses this analogy, as he begins this wonderful picture for us, we need to understand what he was saying because these guys would have understood this. He's saying, look, you know the shepherd that you saw over there at the sheepfold? He's standing in the door so that no enemy can get in and no wayward sheep can get out. He was their security. He was the reason, he was the way that they were fed. He was how they got nutrition. He, he was the way that they were taken care of in that sense. And in order to go anywhere, in order to do anything, they had to go through that one exclusive person 
who at night laid across the hole of that sheepfold. They would have got this message. That man is Jesus. He's the door of eternal life. He's the one that guards. He's the one that guides. He's the one that notice, lets out, and takes in. And so as he begins to speak to these leaders of the blind, that's why they actually ask the question, are we blind also? Are you really saying that we can't actually tell what it is that you're trying to tell us? You, you see, they still believed the law was a door. They still believed the priesthood was a door. They still believed the temple was a door. They still believed that behind that veil that was closed was the door the priest could enter in there. They believed all kinds of ways, ultimately. And in fact, the door to them was not a person. The door was religion. The door was a group of rules and regulations and laws that were to be kept, and if you kept most of them, you'd finally end up okay. But Jesus was saying, I am the door. They were blind. As the door, he was the one way. As the good shepherd, he was also the one who cares for the sheep. You see, he was really trying to tell us a lot about himself. When we think of who our Savior is, we have to remember how much he cares for us. Now, I don't know about you, but as you look at a flock of sheep, normally there are an awful lot of sheep in a flock, amen? Not just one or two, there's enough in there. I think I would have looked at it, and well, that's an acceptable reduction in sheepdom. You know, so one leaks out, maybe a wolf or two gets in. I mean, I've got 500. Who cares? I mean, realistically, I've got a couple of spare sheep. It's not worth putting myself at risk. I'm not laying out there in the middle of the night, freezing myself half to death, wrapped in a tunic in some hole in a rock fence, trying to keep some stinky sheep from getting out. Because if you've ever watched sheep, they are always looking for a way out. They stick their nose in every hole. They're kind of looking through one eye. They get up on their hind legs. They're looking over the wall. Let me out. If I'm the shepherd, I'm thinking... I think the wolf can have that one. I'll just let the one out. It can be eaten. We'll use it as a sacrifice for the rest of the sheep. And yet Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep, and no one gets by me. No one can get in, and not one of them can get out. I love that, because that means that every sheep matters. Every sheep matters. Think about it for a second. Not one sheep is a bad sheep. We look around sometimes, and in our judgmentalism, we we judge which sheep are good and which sheep are bad, amen? Sometimes we look at other people and we go, bad sheep. And of course, we look at ourselves and go, oh, gee. We do that, don't we? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, judge not, lest you by the same manner also be judged yourself. You see, the moment you start judging which sheep are good and which sheep are bad and which sheep are in and which sheep are out, you become the keeper of the sheep. There's only one good shepherd. There's only one who's willing Notice what it says to lay down his life for the sheep. True shepherd always cares for his flock. The Pharisees didn't care for the flock. The 
Pharisees basically couldn't care less about the flock. What they cared about was appearance. What they cared about was money. What they cared about was buildings. What they cared about was a power structure and a hierarchy. That's what they cared about. They didn't care about sheep. Matter of fact, they didn't actually like being around sheep. It's hard to be a shepherd if you don't like sheep. Amen? You got to really like sheep. Because sometimes the sheep are going to try and run over you. Sometimes the sheep are going to be wayward. Sometimes the sheep are going to do things you don't like. Sometimes you're going to have to shear the sheep, clip the sheep. Sometimes they'll need a sheep dip. They need to be sheared. And so Jesus begins to speak to this crowd as they were gathered around listening to this story. It was very clear that the Pharisees were blind and the Palestinian shepherd of that day had an individual call. There's an interesting thing about sheep. One of the things that we have done in the past at the Patmos Discipleship School, one of the wonderful ways that we get people to understand this is we actually give them a sheep. And they have to live with that sheep for a week. Go to a meal, you take the sheep with you. And you talk to the sheep. And after a while, strangely enough, exactly as Scripture says, sheep know the voice of the shepherd. But there's only one way it happens. And that's if the sheep spend time with the shepherd and the shepherd spend time with the sheep. And the way you graduate that little exercise is At the end of the week, we bring all the sheep into a pen. We have each one of the students stand on the edge of the the pen, and you call your sheep. If your sheep comes, good shepherd. Sheep doesn't come, do it again. You see, sheep know the voice of the shepherd. When you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time in his word, When you learn of him, you learn his voice, and you also learn what is not his voice. Because as you learn the truth, the truth sets you free, and all of a sudden the truth becomes the judge of all things. And so when the shepherd calls, you recognize him. You know who he is. You know what destination he's pointing you to. And the good news is, is the shepherd is not going to take you out so that you can be slaughtered. The shepherd's going to take you so you can get a drink, so that you can have some of that living water, amen, so that you can feast on some of that bread of life. Notice verses 3 through 5 here. It says, to, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by, his, by their name, and he leads them out. You see, there's time for us to be out of the sheepfold. Because you can't make disciples by just hanging around other sheep, amen? That's why the church was never meant to be just simply a social club where we gather together and we all tell each other how great Jesus was. Notice I used the past tense, was, because he needs to be present tense now, and you do that by telling people who don't know him. That's what he's saying. He said, leads him out. He puts forth all his own And he goes ahead of them. You see, the Lord goes before us. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, the Lord is going before us into the world. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. The stranger they simply will not follow, but they flee from him. You see, when you're a well-fed sheep, you're going to know the voice of the Lord. And when somebody tells you something, it doesn't match up with what the shepherd has said. And that's not me That's not any man. That is the good shepherd. That is Jesus. He is the word. He alone is perfect. He alone dwells in an inapproachable light. He alone is holy. You know who he is because his word declares it. And so you simply compare what that person says to what the word says. That's why when somebody tells me, you know, well, Mormons or, you know, their theology is pretty solid, I can say, no, it's not solid at all. 
Because as far as I know, Jesus Christ is God. And I'm not. And Mormonism clearly teaches that you yourself not only can become a God, but you literally can become one of Jesus' brothers. Have you ever wondered why it says Elder so-and-so on those name tags? It's because they call him the elder brother. That's not the relationship that we have with Jesus. Jesus is God's only son, not one of many. He's one of one. That makes Joseph Smith a false shepherd. Amen? That makes what he said not true. That makes that the wrong voice to follow, and God's sheep should know it's the wrong voice to follow because we know the voice of the real shepherd, the Lord Jesus himself. There is not another testament of Jesus Christ. Cursed is he who adds to or subtracts from the words of this book, your Bible. It's right there at the end. It's pretty easy to figure out. So somebody that writes another testament, we call that heretical. When someone says that people dwell on the moon or in the middle of the sun, as does the Book of Mormon, which has now been edited to remove it, by the way, but I happen to have an old enough copy that it's still there. I like to take it out from my Mormon friends and say, did you know it said this? I didn't know that was in there. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the Apollo astronauts did not find them. You see, when you hear his voice, you respond to his call. Mary Magdalene knew the call of this great shepherd, didn't he? Didn't she? Remember on that Easter morning, she saw and didn't know who it was. Do you get that little subtlety? John chapter 20, she saw Jesus and didn't know who he was. But when he spoke, what happened? Rabboni. It's you. Word of God, speak. We sing that song, Word of God, speak. We talk about the Word of God breathing life into us. That's the voice of the Lord. In the Word, we find Jesus. Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the good shepherd. He's the Word. You want another striking example? How about John chapter 11? What happened to Lazarus? Lazarus stayed in the tomb until Jesus said, come forth. When the good shepherd spoke, Lazarus came out. Think about it. Jesus is that door. There isn't any other drawer. There's not some other way that you can get there. And when you're inside, when you're with him, you're safe. You're secure. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. I always get people saying, well, you know, so-and-so said this. We get a lot of people that try and preach some form of a prosperity doctrine. Well, I can tell you, that's not the good shepherd. Because the good shepherd said, in this world you will, exclamation point, have tribulation. But know this, I've overcome the world. And if it were not so that in my father's house there's many mansions, I would have told you. But here, you might just go through a few things that you don't really like. Why? Why? Because he leads us in, he leads us out. He has an eternal view in mind, not just a temporal view. We're so focused on temporal things, aren't we, in this world? Isn't it weird how we, we just begin to think about everything as if, well, if we just make it through tomorrow, maybe get through this afternoon, when in fact 
the good shepherd, the door of the sheep, has a view on eternal things. He's got a plan not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for all eternity. And it includes, notice, an abundant life. Notice the abundance there. Check out verses 8 through 11. And all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he'll be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. Notice that we're well fed when we're in Jesus. But the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Anybody in here know what the name Satan means? Adversary, destroyer. Deceiver is another name. Notice what it's saying. Any other shepherd is the enemy. Comes to kill, comes to steal, comes to destroy. But I came that they may have life, and that life abundantly. For I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, Christ is the dividing line. He demands that we make a decision. We're either in, we're out. Probably most of you know that, especially the Rocky Mountains, it's also true here in California with the Sierras, but more so in the Rocky Mountains. The continental divide kind of runs down the the very spine of the Rockies. It's where all the 14,000 foot peaks are, but there's a couple of Places there where the headwaters of a number of rivers kind of come together. But if you happen to be a drop of water and you fall on just one side or the other, you can end up in the White River of Utah, then into the Grand River, into the Colorado and the Gulf of California. But if you happen to hit on the other side, you'll end up in the North Platte River and then in the Missouri River and then in the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. You see, it depends on where you fall on the continental divide. It also depends on where you fall with the good shepherd, with the door of the sheep. Because you're either in or you're out. You're either found in Christ or without Christ. So those conversations that we talk about with our friends, those conversations we have with our coworkers, we need to make sure we tell them the truth. Because what we actually believe is what our Bible says. Every other way is not the truth. It's not something you just leave to chance. Raindrops fall on one side or the other because of the way the wind blows. People are in the sheepfold because of the choice they make to go in through the door. If we make that choice, he knows us individually. If you've never done that, if you've been talking to people about God, but you haven't talked to them about the door, you need to talk to them about the door. Because the door lays down his life for the sheep. It may seem more tolerant to talk about all roads leading to heaven. But in fact, it's the most damning thing that you can actually do. Because if people don't know who the door is, they can't enter in. If you don't care enough to tell them that there's only one way and one truth and one life and no one comes to the Father but by Him, then you've misled them as to how you get to heaven. It's not by coming to this church. It's not by listening to me or any other pastor. It's not by some set of rules or guidelines or things that you do. It is by a person and His name is Jesus. And He is the door. 
let's make sure that we're telling people about the real door. Not one of many, but exactly one of one. There's no greater security than being one of his sheep because he's going to put himself between us and trouble. He's going to put himself between us and starvation. He's going to put himself between us and thirst. He's going to put himself between us and darkness. He'll feed us when we need feeding. He'll give us light when it's dark. He'll give us water that causes us to never thirst. And he alone will protect us from the world that lies outside of our door. Father, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Jesus, we, we don't even know what it's like to find ourselves trying to be our own door. But many do. Lord, they're trying to make their own way, they're trying to find their own truth, make up their own life. They're trying to punch a hole in the wall that is the kingdom, trying to find a new way in, and there isn't one. And so, God, we pray that tonight as we turn our attention to the Good Shepherd, to the door of the sheep, to the bread of life, to the light of the world. We'd find our peace in you. We'd find our joy in you. We'd find our glory in you. But you would receive our praise. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We honor you tonight. Fill us with your spirit, God. Enable us to rest and trust in the door of the sheep. We bless your holy name. We praise you, Jesus.